welcome all you stalwart wine drinkers. Do appreciate you making the effort. I know for some people it was like, please, anything to get me out of the house. And be educational or informative at the same time. And we're very fortunate this afternoon to have Ken Wheeler, who I was also fortunate enough to work with in the city of Portsmouth. But as you all know, there is life after working for city government or any government. So one of the things that Ken went off to do was to work for Farm Fresh as a consultant, wine steward. I ran into him actually one time at one of the Farm Freshes and did not know that uh, he had that other talent because he has many talents. So to try to sort of shorten his biography, um, he has worked for the Virginian Pilot as a reporter and had a million words printed in there. He's attended more than a thousand city council meetings in purpose and in person. And for that, we are so sorry. He's conducted more than 400 wine tasting and last year, he wrote and published a novel, which he has donated to the library, and when and if we ever get a cataloger, it will be in the collection. But he worked for the direct, he was director of communications for the city of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and that's how I knew of him. He's a local government, he was a local government consultant for the United States Agency for International Development in Bulgaria and Indonesia. Uh, he's been a private sector counselor in marketing. He's an adjunct college professor for 10 years. He was the national president of 3, 3CMA, uh, the founding president of the Hampton Roads chapter of PRSA, as well as a Silver Anvil winner and member of PRSA's national award committees. He's a lay leader in his church and in the Presbytery of Eastern Virginia. He's a husband, father, and grandfather who sincerely believes that each and every one of his grandchildren is the best ever. He has a lot of other uh, talents and credentials here, but we really wanted to hear his take on wines and wine tasting, so I am going to turn the podium over to Mr. Ken Wheeler. And thank you so much. Mm. Well, thank you, uh, Sue. And uh, I like to say that of all the introductions I have ever gotten, this one was the most recent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded uh, today of a story, a true story, of a uh, classical get, uh, violinist of another generation who was on tour. And when he went into Minneapolis, this tremendous snowstorm broke out. And he made it downtown to the hotel, but I mean, in Minneapolis, they measure snowstorms in feet. And so he went to the concert hall, and there's just a handful of people in this huge concert hall. And he says, uh, look, instead of performing here on the stage, why don't all of you come back over to my hotel suite? We can have some wine, and I'll take requests. And was met, one man stood up in the middle of the audience and he said, I've driven 200 miles in this snow to hear you sing and I'm not leaving till you do. <laughs> he loved to tell, <laughs> that's right. He loved to tell that uh, story on himself. I had a lot of fun when I retired uh, from the city of Portsmouth. I was in uh, the wine steward in, uh, out in Western Branch, which has since closed. And I saw a sign that said, now hiring wine consultant. Call so-and-so number. So I went home and told my wife I'd seen this sign. And I was thinking about applying. And so after she got up off the floor from laughing, uh, yeah, that kind of put me back a little bit. But a couple of days later, I said, what have I got to lose? I am going to apply. Uh, so I did. And of all things, they hired me. So, which surprised me, I think, as much as it surprised them. Uh, and so, for five years, I served as a wine steward. As Sue mentioned, I kept a log of all the wine tastings I did so I could keep up with what wines uh, I was tasting. And I actually, my final count was 432. 
So that's a lot of wine to open. And one of the great fun things we did, we, uh, we had periodic wine seminars. You're going to love that term. And we had uh, experts come in from uh, California, Australia, Virginia, wherever. And uh, our wine stewards, we had about 12 at that time, uh, spent uh, several hours talking to uh, these wine experts, uh, sampling food, sampling wine. Uh, one night we sampled 24 South American wines. You do a lot of spitting and dumping when you sample 24 wines in one night or you don't drive home. Uh, and then uh, one night uh, was very memorable in a steakhouse in Norfolk. We had a uh, chemist from the Behringer wineries in California and he set up a six course meal and with every course he had a wine pairing and before the course he explained to us in deep chemical terms why he had paired this particular wine with this particular food. It was exhilarating and I don't remember anything he said. It was so uh, <laughs> Uh, so technical. My customers used to, yeah, exactly. My customers used to like to say, "Oh, you're the uh, Farm Fresh Sommelier," and I uh, like to tell them that the difference between a sommelier and a wine steward is the difference between a Formula One race car driver and a FedEx truck driver. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm the FedEx truck driver. And then the other question I got was, I mean, uh, how did you know enough to be a wine steward in, a, in a, a supermarket? And then I would tell the story about these two men who went camping. And one night, a grizzly bear broke into their camp, foaming at the mouth. And one of the guys got up, and he was putting on his sneakers. And the other one said, why are you putting on sneakers? You can't outrun that grizzly bear. He said, oh, I don't have to outrun that grizzly bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> and that's the way it was as a uh, wine steward. I didn't have to know everything about wine. I just had to know more than the customers, which I have to admit, uh, for the most part, was not a real difficult task. So you get to see and hear just about everything in a supermarket and be psychiatrist to uh, an awful lot of the uh, customers who came in. A lot of the ones you don't watch out for. That's exactly right. So, I mean, I had a uh, woman who went through pregnancy, baby, toddler, and I got to play with the toddler. Uh, I had another customer, Australian, really big guy, and I watched him as he got cancer, and he got smaller and he smaller, and he died. So, in five years as a wine steward, I had a lot of regular customers, and a lot of friends that I made uh, during that period of time. People ask me if I miss the job, and my answer is I miss the people. And that was really the most fun uh, part about it. So when Sue asked me to do this, I was trying to think of, she told me I couldn't bring any wine in to taste. And since it's noon, that's probably not a bad idea anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> ah. So I thought what I would do instead, um, I gave her a title of rocket, uh, Wine is Not Rocket Science. And a lot of people get intimidated by wine, let's put it that way, because a lot of the wine names are in these foreign languages. And then there's all this stuff about uh, tastes and cat pee and all this stuff that you hear. And uh, so what I try to do is to really simplify one and uh, also to clear up an awful lot of misperceptions that people have about one. There's a lot of things that most people know about wine that are just not true. So I devised this simple uh, quiz, just a few questions here, and gave you uh, some choices. And at this point, I'll go over them with you and tell you what my answer would be. Does anybody need a pen, or do you just want to do it off the cuff? You can do it off the cuff or, okay. or uh, uh, mark your paper. Either <laughs> They won't be graded. You won't turn them in, and you won't be graded. So, so the first question is, well, first of all, I gave you the opening thought for the day. 
And my wife loves this line, wine improves with age. The older I get, the more I like it. Yeah. So the first question is, how much wine actually improves with age? Very little. Quite a bit to very little. Yeah. I was guessing quite a bit. Ah. Here is the, here's the trick about wine aging. What enables wine to age is called tannin. And most of you have heard of tannin. It's a, it's a chemical that's an astringent. So when you get it in your mouth, it puckers your mouth and you feel this dryness uh, in your mouth and on your tongue. Uh, but it's a great preservative. Uh, so tannin comes from the uh, skin of red wine. There's no tannin in grape juice. So the tannin comes from the skin and the red wine. Oddly enough, the smaller the grapes, the more tannin will be in the wine, which is why Cabernet uh, Sauvignon has the most tannin of any of the wine. The, uh, the Cabernet grapes are actually very small. So unless a wine has, pardon? Is grape skin in wine, do they pulverize grape skin? They do in red wine. They do not in white wine. Um, so, the answer to this question is, wines that have high amounts of tannin last a very long time. In fact, you need to age them because if you drink them too young, you're going to get that really pucker kind of taste in your mouth. But of all the wines in the world, what percentage are they? Really very, very little. And I used to tell people in uh, my supermarket customers, that you ought to drink supermarket wine within one year of the time you buy it. And I actually had customers who, when they bought wine, got home, put a little tag on the wine, sometimes a sticky thing or sometimes just tape something with the date that they bought it. And then they took me very literally that within a year you want to drink that wine. Supermarket wine does not improve with age. It's ready to drink when you take it home. <clears throat> and white wine, particularly, even expensive white wine, does not improve with age. I will not buy white wine that's more than three or four years old. And so you'll see these sales in the supermarket where they're uh, putting wine bottles in the basket and they're selling them for half price. And sometimes that white wine is five or six years old. Don't buy it. <laughs> the other trick about uh, wine and aging is... Uh, oxygen is the enemy of wine. When you open a bottle of wine, it immediately exposes it to oxygen and it starts deteriorating. Then you pour it and you, maybe you don't drink all of it in uh, one setting. So you have some left over. What do you do with that? Yeah, if, if you, uh, you ought to put it in the, fr cork it, put it in the fridge, and then drink it within two or three days. If you, can, if you got one of these vacuum jobbies that sucks the oxygen out, you maybe add one day, maybe. But I would still say, I would advise you <coughs> to, uh, there's, there's one other trick I'll leave with you, by the way, that let's say you have half a bottle of wine left, you also have half a bottle of oxygen left, even if you cork it. So, get a bottle like this, empty it, put the wine in here, and then screw top it, and you've cut down the amount of oxygen that uh, the wine is exposed to. Don't you aerate the wine as you pour it in there, so aren't you also adding some oxygen to the wine? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And uh, some people uh, don't drink wine because of the sulfites, and they're allergic to sulfites. Sulfites are added to wine because sulfite absorbs oxygen. So even very carefully bottling wine, you still wind up with a little residual uh, oxygen in it. And so they add sulfite right at the end. It's not harmful unless you're allergic to it. If you're allergic to it, of course you don't want to get near it. 
So anyway, that's the answer. Very little. So, so you said um, even, even red wine, you would uh, refrigerate after if the bottle is, if you just drunk part of it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In fact, my wife and I did that just a couple of days ago. We had we opened a bottle of Malbec, and we had half of it with a meal. And then the next day, we were going to have the other half. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I took it out of the fridge, put it on the counter. <clears throat> and by 6 o'clock, it was warm enough to drink again. So yeah, don't you don't really want to drink red wine cold, although some people do. So And we'll get to that in a minute, too. Okay, so how much wine actually approves with age? I would actually say D, very little of it, and almost none that you would buy in a supermarket. It doesn't really age a lot after it's bottled, does it? No. I mean, the aging takes place in barrels, right? No, no, no. Uh, wine is aged in uh, barrels, uh, usually in oak, because oak adds a flavor, particularly vanilla, to wine. If you're tasting vanilla in a wine, it comes from oak and not from grapes. <coughs> but if you bottle the wine and the wine has a lot of tannin, it will age. It will, it, the term is it softens the tannin over a period of time. You'll also notice some uh, residual stuff. If you open a bottle of uh, uh, Cabernet that's say 10 or 12 years old, you got a little sediment in the bottom and that's Tannin settling out of the wine. All right, number two, what determines how robust or how soft red wine is? <laughs> yeah, and I'll actually expose the answer to that in the previous question. Uh, and the, uh, although some of those other answers uh, do pertain, I mean, typically the darker a wine is, the more robust it's going to be. Uh, so color does is a clue to how robust the wine is going to be. <clears throat> Acidity, uh, not so much. Uh, we can talk about acid in wine if you want to. It's uh, acid, uh, acid in wine is really good with fatty foods. So a Sauvignon Blanc or a Riesling, which is high in acid, is really good to pair with buttery stuff. And the acid in the Riesling or Sauvignon Blanc will cut right through the butter taste. This is the chemist at work here. Uh, Ken, did I miss something? What puts the tannin into the wine? Is it the type of grape or is it the type of Oh, the skin, the amount of skin. Yeah, tan tannin comes, there's a, I'll go back to uh, basics. Uh, there's no tannin in grape juice. The uh, tannin comes from either the skin, the stem, if stems wind up, or the seeds. So uh, red wines are, uh, are um, done with the skins on them, which is where the color comes from. And white wines are never done with the skins. So there's no tannin in white wine. So the wines always say how much alcohol, but they don't label how much tannin. That's true. You have to judge it for yourself. Although if you go to the website of uh, most of the wineries, they will give you a very detailed chemical breakdown of what's in the wine. So if you really want to know how much tannin it is, go to their website and uh, take a look. No, they don't put tannin on the bottle. By federal law, they have to put the amount of alcohol. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and they put it sideways. That's the other trick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, typically, uh, wine has about 14% alcohol naturally. Uh, once you get to 14%, there's not enough sugar left uh, to convert to alcohol. And uh, not only that, the alcohol starts killing the yeast. So at about 14%, if, you, if you're... Drinking a wine that says it's 18%, it's been fortified. They've added alcohol to it. That's not a natural uh, kind of a thing. Chemical breakdown of wine. Again, I'll go back to my chemist hat. Uh, wine is about 82% water, 14% alcohol, and about 4% everything else. So and one of the clients that I had when I was doing uh, public uh, private sector work, 
uh, sold gasoline, and I found out at that time that gasoline is 95% gasoline and 5% something else. So the difference between Exxon and El Cheapo is that 5%. It's the same thing in wine. It's actually very little of the wine defines the flavor and texture of the wine. So now we know about uh, robust and soft wines. Question number three. I might ask for a show of hands on this one, so don't yell out anything. <laughs> the wine steward in a fancy restaurant opens a bottle of wine for you and places the cork by your plate. What do you do with it? Now, how many people said, smell it? How many people said, roll it between your fingers? We don't have any rollers in here. How many people said, read it? And how many people said, pass it around the table? Being a very congenial sort of person, you know, right? Shared the cork. I actually won a really nice bottle of wine at a wine tasting by answering this question correctly. Everybody else said, smell it or roll it between your fingers. I didn't say anything, and the guy who was conducting the, uh, the seminar said, you haven't answered. What's your answer? And I said, you read it. He said, why would you read it? And I said, because in the 19th century, restaurants uh, typically pulled off scams. They would serve a really nice bottle of wine, and then when it's empty, take it back, clean it, fill it with cheap wine, and put a generic cork in it. So uh, the people who were smart in those days and caught on to the scam would have this sommelier or wine steward open the bottle at the table and hand them the cork. And it, the, the good wineries wrote their name on the cork. And if the name wasn't on the cork, you sent it back because it was probably cheap fill. Actually, nobody does that anymore. So I wouldn't even advise reading it anymore unless you just. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it, that, that is a good idea to look at it and, uh, and the bottom of it, especially in a red wine, you ought to have some red color in there. That means it's been kept on its side and that's good because that cuts oxygen flow. Corks, by the way, are by nature leaky. So over a period of time, corks let oxygen into the wine. So <clears throat> if you use plastic corks, which a lot of wines do now, including Robert Madavi, uh, they seal the wine better in terms of, uh, but they're not as good for the wine as regular corks. So if you're gonna keep wine more than a year, which I don't advise in the first place, you don't want a plastic cork probably. And screw caps are about the same as plastic corks. They're really not quite as good as a sealer of wine as corks. Uh, but they're just so handy, and they're so easy to open. So, and more, even good wineries now are going to uh, screw caps. And the Australians are really starting to really go in that direction right now. So, now you know to read your cork if you want to do anything with it. Okay, number four. Your car salesman recommends a wine-colored car. What color is it? Ah, <laughs> yes. ah, you caught my secret. <laughs> so actually, what color is wine? Uh, I can tell you from opening wine at 424 wine tastings that wine is every color you can think of. Some of it is almost clear, especially some of the uh, Portuguese Vino Verdes. And then some of it is almost black. I mean, real dark red, purple color. And then in between is green and pink and just about everything else you can think of. 
So uh, the answer is, I would say any of the above, but embedded in people's head is still the idea that there is such a color as wine, maybe your sweater or my shirt. Uh, I once had a wine colored car. It was kind of burgundy colored. Uh, so, so why would uh, the wine steward, other than this is a wine colored shirt, wear a shirt like this? Because I'm opening bottles of wine all the time. And if the red spills on me, which I, I can show you bunches of white shirts at home that have little red dots on them. Uh, but on this one, you don't notice it. So it's a nice shirt to conduct the wine tasting with. <clears throat> Another quick tip. If you get red wine spilled on nice white or off-white, uh, how do you get it out? It's hard to do. It's, yeah, it's hard to do. You know, the, uh, the easiest way to, well, first of all, you need to get it while it's wet. If you let it dry, let it dry you're dead. Um, but the easiest way to do it is with white wine. White wine will take out red wine. Wow. Yep, immediately. So. so do you spray it? Do you rub it? What, what do you do? do any, you way, any way you want to do it. You can pour it, and then you can suck the cloth. I mean, you can. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but that's an interesting little wide steward tip. The best way to get out white wine is with uh, red wine, is with white wine. In fact, I'll tell you another funny story. That I worked in the Great Bridge supermarket for four years, and we were only two blocks from the inland waterway in a marina where people were constantly coming through in these huge yachts. And one time this couple came in and they said, we've just come from two months in Europe and we need to stock up on wine. I said, okay, fine. So we get a basket and they're picking off all these high in, high price white wines. And uh, we get the basket just about full. And I'm like, well, don't you want to buy any red wine? And they said, let us explain this. <laughs> on our sailboat, Everything is white. The carpeting, the furniture, we have no red wine on that boat. <laughs> true, true. Okay, uh, next question. There's kind of, some, kind of some interesting questions that have to do with uh, uh, how many grapes, how many acres, and all that kind of thing. So I did put one on here just for the heck of it. How many grapes does it take to make one bottle of wine? Doesn't it depend on the size? It doesn't depend on the size. Zillions. <laughs> <laughs> Most people would say more than one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah one won't work. That's going to be pretty weak wine. Uh, the actual answer to that is 300 for most wines. It does vary a little bit. Uh, depending on what kind of wine it is, but the average is right around 300 grapes for uh, one bottle of wine. <clears throat> now, you want to take these numbers out. One grape brine produces about 10 bottles of wine. 10 bottles of wine from one grape vine. And there are about 400 vines per acre. So if you want to start a winery, you can do some math here and figure out that if you have one acre of uh, vineyards, you can produce about 4,000 bottles of wine. So pretty good yield, actually, when you think about it. In a good year. In a good, in a good place. Yeah, right. All right, and speaking of that leads us to our next question. The biggest trouble with Virginia wine is... And a, a little bit of all of the above, but uh, my standard answer to that, because I got that question a lot, do you recommend Virginia wines? And my answer was, you know there's only one trouble with Virginia wines, and that's California. The California wines are so dependable, from, especially from one year to the next, are so high quality, 
the vineyards have been there now ever since Prohibition, most of them. They, a lot of them shut down during Prohibition. Until uh, this year's fire. But I've got good news for you. Of the uh, harvest of the 2017 grapes, especially in Napa and Sonoma, where they had a lot of fires, were largely already in fermentation by the time of the fires. They were either on oak or in vats. So I am told that the yield from California for 2017 is going to be fine. <clears throat> and there was a footnote to that. I'm a member of the uh, Robert Mondavi Club, I think is what they call it. And during the fires, they kept sending out bulletins about what was going on. They never had any at Oakville, where, uh, in Napa Valley, where the Robert Mondavi uh, winery is. But uh, they kept telling us that, uh, that even when the fires were around the winery, uh, that first of all, if you look at vineyards, there aren't any trees. So there's nothing to catch on fire. And the vineyards themselves are tremendously moist. So they're fire resistant by nature and of course low. So even if the fire is kind of in embers of sweeping by, the, uh, the grapevines stay pretty protected. And as a footnote, the Robert Mondavi newsletter said, however, some of the late yield wines may taste a little smoky. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question seven, true or false? To grow great wine grapes, you need warm days, warm nights, and rich soil. Nobody seems to be buying that. Yeah. The truth is, if you have warm days, warm nights, and rich soil, you can grow some really nice supermarket grapes. They're going to be nice and fat and juicy and they're gonna make terrible wine, <laughs> terrible wine. For the most part, what you want is, uh, and we had a visitor from Robert Mondavi who kept uh, emphasizing this to our wine stewards at Farm Fresh. You want warm days, you want cool nights, and you want poor soil. Most of Napa and Sonoma, before they became wineries, were ranches horse ranches or cattle ranches, because the soil is just not good enough there to grow fruits and vegetables for the market. But they discovered that that really poor soil in Napa and Sonoma was great for growing grapes, wine grapes, not supermarket grapes, wine grapes. Uh, and then in addition to that, they have um, the California fog, if you've ever been to San Francisco, you've probably seen the fog rolling in from the Pacific. <clears throat> in Napa and Sonoma are 10 to 20 miles inland from the Pacific, and every morning that fog rolls in and just bathes the grapes with moisture, and it's, it's wonderful for them. So the reason for the poor soil is uh, the uh, wine growers want to make the vineyards fight for nutrients. And so the roots go down and have to, and, and which is another reason you want older vines, because the older they are, the deeper the roots and the more they're picking up nutrients uh, from the, the uh, soil. And we could go on about that, but I won't. So uh, the French have a thing they call terroir. You can probably spell that, but not pronounce it like most French. Uh, terroir, and it has to do with what the soil is like uh, where you uh, grow the grapes. And it can vary widely. You can go to a vineyard where in one spot the soil is uh, one loamy or whatever, and then go to another spot where it's very flinty, and the, the wine from those different areas tastes different. So that's as far as I'm going with terroir. And then the uh, last question, I actually have a bonus question here in case you've missed any of these uh, during the quiz. <coughs> the, be the best one is the most expensive, the least expensive, what's on sale, or what you like. Now, I can't tell you how many customers I had come in and what's their first question? What's on sale? Oh. What's on sale? 
You got any specials this week? Uh, Uh, question is, can you assume a more expensive wine is going to be a better wine? Uh, and I'll answer that in a minute, but I'll tell you a story first. Uh, one of the wine schools, and there are universities where you can get degrees in wine now, especially in California, did some very interesting taste tests in different parts of the country. And they did this for several years. And one of the taste tests was a blind test. The uh, bottles were covered with paper bags and bound at the top. And then you tasted the wine and you gave your feedback and so on. In the blind test, people frequently chose the cheaper wine over the more expensive one, frequently. Then they did another series of tests in which they told the people before the test this is a $5 bottle of Barefoot. This is a $50 bottle of Montevino. Now, I want you to taste these and tell me which one is better. And every time, people pick the more expensive one. <laughs> That's a big difference, though. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, huh? So the tremendous amount of psychology involved in wine just in general. So. They might like a sweet red. But is it because our palates are used to cheaper wines if we typically buy cheaper wines and we don't under appreciate the complexity well, you can of them? That. Exactly. You can exactly. That. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and again, <clears throat> I'll answer that in a minute, but I'll tell you another story. Uh, I went to a tasting in Virginia Beach that was sponsored by Moet. Moet, uh, uh, the most expensive wine champagne uh, company in the world. They're based in France, of course. They're pronounced Moet and not Moe, even though they're French, because the founder was from Belgium and his name was Moet. I frequently had people coming in and asking for a bottle of Moe, which doesn't exist, so anyway. Uh, so at this uh, wine tasting, we tasted uh, Chandon Champagne, which is Moet's uh, winery in California to make sparkling wine. And it was good, and it was about 20 bucks. It was good, it was fine. In fact, I recommend Chandon if you want a nice $20 sparkler. Then we did Moet, same kind of wine, a Brut. And Moet's about 50 bucks. Now, can I tell the difference between the Chandon and the Moet? Yeah, yeah, I could tell the difference. It was just a richer kind of a taste. A little more lavish kind of feeling. Then we tasted Dom Perignon. Yeah. Dom Perignon is about 150 bucks. And I gotta tell you the truth, I couldn't tell much difference between the Moet and the Dom Perignon. And maybe that's my problem. Uh, but in general, I would say the answer to your question is yes. In general, the more expensive wine is, the better it is. <clears throat> because the market determines the price of a wine. And if a wine is really good, people are willing to pay more for it. And if it's really cheap, they are not willing to pay much for it. So, uh, but then the other question I used to get, and this uh, drove me absolutely crazy, is uh, people would come in and say, I want to buy my boss a bottle of wine for his birthday. And I know he drinks Cabernet Sauvignon. So, what do you recommend? And I'm like, well, how much do you want to pay? That's the question you're going to get real quick from the wine steward. And the answer I always got was, I want it to be a really nice wine that will impress him, but I don't want to pay too much. <laughs> and then my answer would, generally, if I got that kind of question, I'd take him to a 15 or $20 bottle of wine. And if the boss is so fussy, he loves $50 bottles of wine, he ought to buy his own wine, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, 
the bonus question, and I didn't put this on your quiz, so I'll just ask it. I picked this up from a trivia book I was reading the other night. Wine is mentioned in every book of the Bible except one. I could leave you hanging with that, and you can go home and read 66 books of the Bible. <laughs> one book of the Bible, wine is never mentioned. Ah. Oh, okay. That's true. No, even shorter. There's some that are like one and a half pages. I can't remember which one. Same with your Philippians 2. All right, I'll put you out of your misery. John, John, is that one? The answer is Jonah. Jonah. No wine at all. Maybe Jonah could have used some wine. That's a different. That's isn't Jonah the, no, is that the one with the whale? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who was it, Noah? Didn't Noah get drunk on wine afterwards? Yes, he did. And it's not mentioned yes. in there? Not mentioned. Oh. Well, I'm taking the, I haven't read all 66 books to check this out. <laughs> so I'm taking the trivia book's word on this. But if anybody finds out something different, let me know. So, so and then we have a closing uh, thought. And if we have a few minutes left, I'll be glad to take any questions uh, that you have beyond your quiz. Uh, the closing thought, it's attributed to W.C. Fields, although a lot of stuff having to do with alcohol is attributed to W.C. Fields. <laughs> That's right. I cook with wine, and sometimes I put it in the food. All right. And then the last thing... The last thing I'll do before... I'll stop talking, is I just uh, point out to you that I gave you a uh, sheet. I asked Sue at first, she told me I couldn't open any, so I said, well, can I bring in one that's unopened? And that caused her a little trauma, but she finally <laughs> figured out it probably wasn't against the law to bring in unopened wine to a library. <clears throat> yeah, my, wine, my wife is the one who talked me out of it. She said, that sounds like bad form to me. <laughs> so, uh, and besides which, bringing in 10 or 12 bottles of wine would be it. heavy. Well, we could have a <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, Out to the parking lot. I like it. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, or we could go to my suite. <laughs> so uh, I gave you a list here of, uh, and this is, Absolutely only my list. I'm sure everybody in here would make up a different list. But um, wine stewards particularly like to have go-to wines. So if somebody comes in and says, <clears throat> I'm having such and such tonight, and I want a bottle of Chardonnay, what do you recommend? Uh, my answer would be generally to start with Sterling. And we've been to the Sterling winery, and I can tell you how, what a great experience that is and so on. And uh, it's not, uh, the Sterling Vintners choice is about 10, 12 bucks. And it's a really nice uh, Chardonnay. And then on down through the list, as you can see, these wines are from all over the world. The only country that is missing, interestingly enough, is France. France is the biggest wine producer in the world and the biggest wine consumer in the world. But uh, supermarket wine stewards, unlike sommeliers, know very little about French wines. So, and that certainly includes me. <clears throat> so you've got my list here. For the most they, part, they, they don't, the supermarkets don't, don't carry them because they're too expensive. Not, Be, because you're not going to sell a, a lot of $150 Grand Cru okay. French wines in a supermarket. Yes. The supermarkets are driven. I'll tell you a secret here. I'm probably not supposed to tell you this. <clears throat> but I don't work for Farm Fresh anymore, so I'll do People would come in and say, you used to carry so-and-so and so wine. You don't carry it anymore. Why not? And my answer would be, I hate to tell you this, but our wine supply is totally driven by the market. If you will buy it, we will shelve it. If you don't buy it, it's going to go out of here. It's that simple. And supermarkets will also, if you've got a favorite brand, 
If you go <coughs> to buy a Chardonnay and they don't have Sterling, a lot of times they'll stock it if you request that they do that. I had that happen on several occasions. I had a woman who loved Dr. Lucen Riesling from Germany. <coughs> and at the time she came in and asked for it, we didn't have any. And I stocked it and she bought about a case a month, which is fine. You know, that was a good deal for us. So anyway, that's my wine list. And I'll show you down at the bottom, there are a couple of things are added that are a little added value. The best inexpensive brand, and people ask me this all the time, I don't want to spend more than four, five, six bucks for wine. What do you recommend? My answer is Redwood Creek. It's uh, out of California. It's kind of at the foot of Yosemite, uh, the winery. And it picks up a lot of minerals when the, uh, when the water come, melts in the spring and comes down through the uh, rivers. Uh, so I think Redwood Creek for the price is a, is a very nice wine. Not as good as some of these other ones up here because they're more expensive. <coughs> and then the best value I did uh, completely by accident. And again, a confession, I'm not a big fan of Yellowtail. Yellowtail is the biggest selling wine brand in the world. They crank that stuff out by the millions of cases and sell it all over the world. Uh, but I'm not a real big fan of it. But one day, we had just gotten a bunch of uh, yellowtail wine brought into our wine department. And <clears throat> I was getting ready to do a, a tasting. So I said, I need to get rid of some of this yellowtail, so I'll taste some of it. And uh, we had about a case and a half of yellowtail Riesling. And I'd never had it before. So I said, OK, I'll taste this. So uh, I did the tasting and discovered, to my absolute surprise, that it is a very decent Riesling. I'm not a big fan of California Riesling, because they're almost always too sweet. <coughs> German Riesling, you better know what you're doing, because it comes in all kinds of grades of sweetness and can get very pricey. Uh, the one I gave you as my go-to is Chateau St. Michel out of Washington State. And they actually uh, sell Riesling uh, dry, regular, and sweet. You can find it in most uh, supermarkets that way. Uh, but Yellowtail Riesling, for about five bucks, uh, is a very, and I keep a bottle in the fridge all the time. The, uh, and I'll make one closing comment here, because uh, I keep promising you can ask questions. Uh, two wines that are the most versatile with food, or Riesling, uh, get one that's not real sweet because that kills the taste of your food, uh, but a Yellowtail or Chateau Saint Michel or Dr. Lucen from Germany <clears throat> is very food friendly. It's high in acid, it's very uh, tasty and goes with a wide range of foods. And the, uh, the other wine that is so versatile is Pinot Noir. I am a huge fan of uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, it's a very soft red wine, very low in tannin. You already knew that since I said soft. Uh, and uh, therefore, it goes with uh, all kinds of food that is otherwise hard to match. I mean, think Thanksgiving. You're going to have turkey and ham and maybe duck and goose and stuff like that. What kind of wine do you serve with that stuff? You know, the, not a deep red, not a soft white. Pinot Noir is perfect with that stuff. So if you're, if you're really serving something or a casserole where you're having trouble figuring out a wine match, think about Riesling or Pinot Noir. It might uh, pair up with it very well. So having done that, well, I have a question. I have friends that live in Oregon. Ah. And they would, they would be upset because there are no Pinot Noirs or Pinot Grigios from Oregon on this list. So if you've never been to the Oregon wineries, you should go. Ah, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Columbia River Valley. Well, <clears throat> yeah. I, again, a confession. Every time I get on a plane to go to wineries on the West Coast, I wind up in Napa Valley. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, what is a white merlot? 
Uh, there's white Merlot, there's white Zinfandel, there's other kind of white. Um, what, I'll try to give you a short answer to this. So, well, sometimes I know too that's much. That's the wine I like. Okay. Because I don't like red, I don't like a dark red wine. Right. But I'm wondering where in the heck it comes from. In the late 70s, early 80s, people were getting tired of Chardonnay and wanted a different kind of light wine. And so the Sutter Home Winery, almost by accident, discovered that they could take the Zinfandel grape, which is a very robust red grape, and um, ferment it till most of the residual sugar was left. So they ferment it to about seven or eight percent alcohol. The rest is residual sugar. And the color is pink, it's not really white. And then that caught on. White Zinfandel caught on. Most wine stewards are not real big fans of sweet wine, just in general. Yeah. But uh, then white, they did the same with so Merlot. Have, yeah, so it's not a mixture <coughs> no. of white and, and red grapes. No, it's just, and I'll give you another example. Pinot Noir is one of the three major grapes of Champagne. And you're thinking, well, how could that be? Because Champagne, for the most part, is n not red. And the answer is they don't put the skins in the champagne, only the juice. So you get no red color at all. Where are the other two grapes? Can uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Meunier, M-E-U-N-I-E-R, Meunier. It's mostly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. I'm looking to, I want to travel out of the country. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And where it's reasonable, what would you suggest? What place would you suggest to go to? Wow, wow. <clears throat> uh, I'll give you a real offbeat answer. Sue mentioned that I did some consulting work for the USAID in Bulgaria. I went over there four times. I worked on the project for five years. And I discovered that the red wines in Bulgaria are absolutely delicious. They don't export much of it to the West. A lot of it goes to Russia and Eastern Europe. <clears throat> but uh, Eastern Europe red wines are absolutely delicious. So if you happen to go to anywhere in Eastern Europe, yeah, Prague or wherever. Um, but most, wine is such a prevalent thing these days that almost anywhere you go is gonna have a, for example, if you go to the Mendoza area of Argentina, and a friend of mine did this trip <clears throat> two years ago, I guess. They flew into Buenos Aires. They took a train to Mendoza, which is a bit of a train trip. Uh, and in Mendoza, they have absolutely great wines, wonderful wines, including Malbec. And then they took a bus ride over the Andes. They told me they will never do that again. Oh and then they went into Chilean wines, <clears throat> cabs and... Uh, Carmen Air and Malbec and a lot of interesting. So South America would be a wonderful place to do wine. But almost anywhere you go these days, they're going to have pretty good wine. The other comment I would, would make, and I meant to say this earlier on, uh, cheap wine ain't what it used to be. 20 years ago or so, uh, cheap wine was really rough. I mean, when you taste it, you're know, like, oh boy, you know, this is awful stuff. Winemaking has improved to the point now. There's really not much any such thing as bad wine anymore. Even two buck chuck. I keep I keep a bottle of three buck chuck on my wine rack. The Merlot. I don't like their whites. Uh, you like the Shiraz? Oh yeah, the Shiraz is pretty good, but the Merlot is particularly good. Uh, so there's really, uh, I mentioned Redwood Creek, and it sells for around five bucks. And there's not, the, di the difference is in the texture of the wine. You just get more robustness and more flavors out of a more expensive wine. But the inexpensive wines are not bad these days. Yeah, 10 years ago, I, I would not have thought to buy a Chardonnay unless it was at least $15. Or let's make it 15 years ago. It's mm. gotta be about $15, and that was a lot then. Mm. Um, for every day, and now, as you say, you can get good ones for 
Oh, nine to nine to fifteen instead of twenty dollars and up. Very true. So it must, I said I'm not getting worse. My tasters are getting worse. Right, right, right. And and that winemaking has improved. Every state in the union has a winery. Mm -hmm. Virginia is about fifth now, I think, in wine That's production. Right. Yeah, in the United States, and there's some decent uh, Virginia wines: uh, Chateau Marset, uh, okay, Barbersville. Barbersville, Barbersville, yeah. Williamsburg, and again, winemaking has improved to the point that even small new wineries are producing pretty good wine. Yes. One more. Question. One more. Oh, two more. Oh, two, two more. more. Well, you haven't said anything about box wines, but they are becoming better in quality. Um, lot out of Australia. <coughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that's, does that help with, you know, there's no oxygen getting in. <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest advantage of the box wines is that it's in the bladder that as you drink the wine, the bladder bleeds down and you don't get oxygen into the wine. So they last for, a, depending on how much you drink, they yeah. last for a longer time than just regular 750 milliliter bottles. And there are some decent, uh, I don't know there are any bad uh, box wines. I wouldn't get any of those great big ones. The that five in, liter ones. That's in the back. But something like a black box, for example, mm -hmm. is a very decent. And often you can get uh, black box in restaurants now, in Merlot or Chardonnay or whatever, for a decent price. So some of the boxes are pretty good. Just real fast, this has been very informative. I love wine. If one wanted to learn more about wine, are, is there a local course or wine or any place that you would recommend? Mm. Uh, and does ODU offer anything, or is it kind of through senior center programs or other? Do you, do you have any thoughts? Bon Vivant down in uh, North Suffolk, don't they still give? Yeah. I mean, kind of a formal something that might... Oh, very informal and you taste, and oh boy. Oh, yeah, but I mean more formal. Yeah. Oh. I don't really know the answer to that. I just wondered if you... There used to be a professor from um, Old Dominion that would do a lengthy eight or ten week long. Hmm, right, right. Course. But he's recently <coughs> died. Oh, uh, okay, so that's over. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah I just <laughs> but thought if you had someone, I'd like to know. Who could I, no, I don't know, but I can tell you that there are a lot of uh, good books on wine. Some are on display uh, here in the library, out in the lobby. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. It's an uh, old man's guide to outsmarting wine, which is kind of like rock, wine is not rocket science. Oh, yeah. And it's a very practical approach, including recommending a lot of brands in different price ranges. So I find this to be a, a very useful uh, kind of book. Uh, by the time I finished my wine stewards thing, I must have had a library of 20, 25 wine books. And I have melted that down. I've given most of them to the friends of the Portsmouth Public Library. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> so thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, just to remind you, uh, Ken Wheeler's novel, The Other Woman, A Detective Peach Mystery, look for it in another few weeks. Um, it is very nicely done. I actually read a preview copy of it way back when, when he was working on it, and um, it, it stands up very well with the other mysteries that you might be um, reading nowadays. Next month, we will be having Dr. Elias Siraj, who's the director of the EVMS Strylitz Diabetes Center, New Treatment Options for Diabetes. I have heard him speak because I serve on the Portsmouth General Hospital Foundation Board, and diabetes is one of their main emphasis is now, and he is an excellent speaker and oh, so knowledgeable. So if you know anybody that is living with diabetes or um, pre-diabetic, please have them come and listen to him. It'd be very informative. And thank you again for coming.